My guest today has quite a story to tell us. Tyrone Williams is a barber in Sacramento, California. He was involved in a very bad auto accident in which he lost his arm. He also flatlined and was considered dead. During that moment, he saw hell. Tyrone is on the telephone right now from his barbershop in Sacramento, California, to tell us that experience. Tyrone Williams, welcome to True News. Hey, thank you guys for inviting me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your uh, work day to be with us uh, now. And uh, you're speaking to an audience all over the world. We want to hear. Don't be nervous. We want to hear what happened to you. Tyrone, when did this accident take place? Uh, the accident happened uh, July the 5th of 2001. All right. I actually went online and I found a, a newspaper article about that accident. And it was just, it was just a, an, you know, it was a local newspaper article about an accident and mentioned your name. And I, I believe you were, you were driving a pickup truck. Is that correct? Yes. We were in a Silverado, Chevy Silverado, King Cab, Step Side. Interstate 5 in California. Yes, we were on I-5, and the driver of the truck had fell asleep as I was already asleep on the passenger side of the truck. And I was awakened by the truck being out of control in the middle of the freeway. What time of the day was this accident? It was early in the morning. I would say it happened around 7, something close to 8 in the morning. Work day or weekend? We were coming back from spending the 4th of July up in Weed, California. That's where I'm from. Okay. So it was a 4th of July weekend. You're coming back yeah. from the 4th of July uh, weekend, yeah. um, 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, had you guys been driving all night? Uh, no, we left from uh, Sacramento to Weed. is three hours. Okay. So we jumped up pretty early in the morning, about at least about 4, 4 or 5 in the morning and started driving. We were pretty close to Sacramento. Okay, but the driver, your buddy, was uh, didn't get enough yeah, rest was, during the night. It was a young lady. Well, actually, I started the trip out driving. So it was like about an hour and a half outside of Sacramento. We switched seats, and she started to drive. And that's when about 40 minutes into the trip from her taking over is when she went to sleep. Okay. Tyrone, how would you describe your spiritual uh, <laughs> condition July 5th, 2001, before that accident? Before the accident, actually, it was a little different, you know, because to be home and seeing all your family members and then seeing the place that you're from, looking at, you know, the area, the mountains, because Mount Shasta is right, it's right there where I'm oh, from. How beautiful so place! A mm-hmm. Big volcano sitting right in front of you know the house. So I'm looking around at everything, you know, spending time with the with my peoples. And then, uh, you know, that night I fell asleep on the floor at my mother's house. Mm-hmm. She woke me up in the morning to get ready to go. So to wake up out of a dead sleep, you know, looking at her. You know, and getting in the truck, that was the last memory that I had was her waking me up. Uh, How how would you describe your your spiritual position in life at that time? Did you consider yourself a Christian? No, I wasn't a Christian. I mean, I wasn't a true follower, no, because I was living the lifestyle. I I sold drugs. I, you know, got drunk, got high. You know, I had different women, and I was going home to visit my family. And it was at a point in time where I had really given up in life. So I didn't care what took place, what happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And at a point of me just on that road uh, of not caring, and God had already done so much, he showed me what it was worth. Looking back on those years, you know, you were drinking, doing drugs, uh, running around, having fun, the whole thing. Do you see places in your life where, looking back, you now realize the Holy Spirit was dealing yes. with you? Yes, there was one <laughs> particular incident. And there were several, but I knew God was 
dealing with me. But yet I couldn't understand nor explain what I was going through, even though I had to go through it. There was one time I was selling drugs, right? And uh, I came to Sacramento, you know, to recop, pick up some more. But while I was here, the Lord gave me two dreams, two nights in a row, that I would be in a raid, you know, when I got back to where I was going. You had these dreams while you were there visiting your family and weed? No. This is, you asked me about an experience. Yes, okay. This is an experience where God showed me this was during my life. Mm -hmm. In between, you know, it was like, uh, I was like in my 20s. Okay. And uh, I was out there, and he gave me two dreams, two nights in a row before I got back to the place where I was going to, that I would be in a raid. And for sure enough, we had drugs, we had a pistol in the, in the back seat of the car, in the trunk area, and I had the drugs on me because they were mine, and I was going back to where I was. And along the way, my friend was looking at me, and he was like, man, what's wrong? And I was nervous, and I told him, I said, man, I just had two dreams, two nights in a row, that we're going to be in a raid. And he looked at me and said, man, well, what you want to do? You want to turn around? I said, no, let's just keep going. And as I kept going, for sure enough, as soon as I got into the town and got to where I was going to, the police was waiting on me. And I'm sitting there, and I'm tripping out, and, you know, I come out of there. I had the drugs on me in the whole nine, and they overlooked the drugs and allowed me to come out. And... I knew right then God had showed me, you know, that he was with me and that he would help me. He would save me. He would deliver me. But you didn't repent. I didn't repent because it wasn't his fullness. Mm -hmm. It was to this point because the whole point of the witness, you have people that are in different lifestyles. and, And for him to take me out of all of that and even to the point of hell, you know, all of that was part of the testimony, part of the story right. and events that had to transpire in my life for the testimony. But when you got caught up in that raid and it actually came down like you saw in those two dreams. Yes. You were aware that it was God. Yeah, it, I was aware, fully aware. <laughs> you see, it's interesting. You you were deep was, in sin. You were in rebellion. God gave you prophetic dreams showing you the yes. trouble you were going to get in. He yes. got you out of the trouble. You are aware that it's God that got you out of the trouble, and yet you still don't repent. Why? You know, Tyrone, we're all like this, aren't we? Yes, we are. And what it was, all right, now he helped me to understand by him being a gardener. A certain fruit before it's ready has to go through a certain point of season, right? Mm-hmm. No fruit grows all at one time. Certain fruit grows in the summer, some grows in the winter, some grows in the spring, some grow in the fall. Now, (laughs) if he's divine dressman, he knows the condition and and the things that it takes in order for this fruit to come. Sometimes it might have to be pruned. You know, certain trees have to be pruned in order for it to produce. Right? That's right. So God, he's the one that's all-knowing. And he's the gardener. And in order for us to produce at the time where we need to, it's like, I didn't understand it, but now I do as I got into his word. And when I look back, I can say that if it hadn't have been for the Lord on my side, you know, all the way to the depths of hell from escaping prison, he allowed me to escape the physical prison to show me that there is a spiritual prison. What was the time span between that experience with the police raid and the accident? Uh, I would say another 10 to 15 years. Wow. 10 to 15 yeah. years. So you continued yeah. on your way in dealing drugs and everything, and you just went on with your life. Even though you had, a, you had a close encounter, you could have went to prison and God gave you warning. He intervened. He kept you from prison. So now, let's. Uh, w- were there any other warnings during that time? Well, there was a, one before that one. 
and it was the first one. Okay. <laughs> and this is the call. <laughs> I was 13, and I was in Weed, California, so we're kind of going back in history, so allowing you to see okay. the different calls that he gave me. The last one was me going to hell. The, the second one was him getting me out of the raid. The first one was when I was 13, and he asked me a question. And I knew it was him, as clear as day. You know when he speaks. And he said, did you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross and went to hell and rose from the grave? And I was a kid, and he was asking me this question. It was kind of like in a dare sense, wow. you know. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know that he died. I know that he went into hell, and I know that he rose from the grave. And it kind of put me in a, in a position to where, like, all right, if he did it, what you going to do? <laughs> and I was so silly enough to say out of my mouth to God, I said, well, if he did it, I could do it. If he died and went to hell and rose, so could I. You said that at age 13? Man, at age 13. Just the, uh, it was in you. It was either... In you or not, and that's the way growing up in the mountains, wow. you know, they we kind of was. We were daredevils. You know, if so-and-so did it all, I could do it, too. And that was, you know, I know. I, I grew, I grew, we were. I grew up in the Appalachia Hills of Western Maryland. Yeah. I know so what you're talking God, about. What he did, he said, what it was, it wasn't the fact that he did, but it was the means and how he did. Because it said, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my what? My spirit, saith the Lord. No man can rise from the depths of hell by his own might or by his own power. But the only way you'll ever get from this place is by his spirit. Tyrone, when I was a young man, this is, you know, I'm talking about in, in, in the 70s, I was uh, deeply into you know smoking dope and you know, pot and hashies mostly drinking a lot you know just a lot of beer tequila and and whiskey yeah. and i never i never did uh the hallucinogenic stuff i just you know yeah. i stayed with pot and hashish you know and, yeah. and lots of liquor you know <laughs> but i was uh you know all i did was have fun i just i yeah. I, I wanted to have a party I always wanted to be at a party and that's all uh -huh. i was doing of course, I had a job and everything. I did my, you know, but on weekends, that's that's what yeah. I live for. Hey, yeah. weekend's going to come. I'm going to be, I'll be drunk and stoned from Friday night till Sunday night, you know? That was it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what happened to me several times, not just once or twice or three times. It happened a number of times. I would be in a party on a Saturday night and everybody's, all my buddies are there and we're having a a great time and everybody's laughing and shouting and we got music and there's all kinds of booze and everything's yeah. going on. And, and, and I would hear my name. I would audibly <laughs> hear my name. I would hear this voice say, Rick. And I would just stop and he would say it again, Rick. And I would walk, I would walk outside and I'd look up at the sky because I knew that the voice came from the sky. Yeah. And honestly, there were times I thought maybe it was a space alien talking to me. I didn't know who was talking to me. I would look up in the sky and I'd say, who are you and why did you say my name? Mm -hmm. And there was nothing, nothing. But I would be instantly sober. I would just snap yeah, out of it. I don't, care. I don't care how drunk and stoned I was. Whenever that voice said my name, I sobered right. up. And I would go back in the party and I would tell my friends, I'm going home. And then, you know, everybody, no, come on, Rick, don't, you know, stay, stay. No, no, I'm going home. I'm going home. <laughs> and because I didn't want to, I didn't want to do this anymore. But then it would wear off. And the next weekend I'd be stoned and drunk again. And this, yeah. this went on and on and on. I don't know how many times he called my name. <laughs> he loves yeah. us, Tyrone. He loves he, us. He loves us so much. As you talk about calling your name, right? Mm -hmm. From when he called me when I was 13 and he asked me that question. After I said I, I could do it, he showed me in a quick panoramic like vision of me leaving weed, but just journeying out the mountains and down toward the valley. It was just in a quick vision. 
And right after that, I told my mama, <laughs> I got to go. I, I need to go to my dad. I'm ready to go. And it was just put in my spirit to leave, and I was trying to find my dad. And I went to live with my dad, but he was there, but it really it was God who was calling me. <laughs> you know, but he sent me to my father because I needed to know him through my father at that time. But then my first mission was to Miami, Florida. And I went over and stayed with uh, some Cuban brothers and sisters in Christ, right? And it was kind of like Paul going on his first mission. <laughs> and I said, Lord, look, I'm out here. I ain't got no drugs with me. I ain't got no girls with me. I said, but where is Uncle Luke at? Because the way it was with us, whenever we go to any town, we want to see, you know, a, a prominent person from that town, right? And uh, instantly, now we're outside of Miami. We're like about 30 to 40 minutes outside some other town. And as soon as I asked God that question within my spirit, I wanted to see Luke Skywalker, you know, the the rapper. Sure. <laughs> Because I was there just to say, okay, I was in Miami and I seen Luke. <laughs> Man, instantly, the guy that was driving the truck, he said, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. Man, I pulled into this gas station. He didn't hear me ask the question. He didn't hear me say nothing. But he was turned into this gas station stall and ran into the place to use the bathroom. And while he's in there... There's a gas station in there, and there's a unisex uh, salon. So I walk in there because I'm a barber, and I, you know, first time being out this way. So I'm walking in to see, you know, who's in there and introduce myself. Then all of a sudden, I walk back outside. I call my wife on the phone, and I'm telling her, you know, how the trees look out there. It's real tropical. You know, it's a little different. You know, out here, the air is different. And, you know, it's nice out here. And all of a sudden, the Range Rover pulls into the driveway. Now, we're parked at the last gas station stall on the outside, the first one that you pull up to. The Range Rover pulls on the inside stall to the second one. So he's in front of me, but on the inside. And I'm talking on the phone, and all of a sudden, God said, look. And it was the audible voice. <laughs> And it was the one that put trembling fear up in me. And I, I cringed when I heard him call. When, when he said, look, I, I didn't want to look, but I had to look because God said, look. <laughs> and I was cringing down, but turning my head over as I looked over. And guess who was standing there? Luke Skywalker. That's right. At the gas pump. <laughs> I said, no, get out of here. He he looked over at me because I said, no, get out of here. <laughs> I walk over to him. I look at him. He look at me. <laughs> I start busting up. I just said, man, here, I got to just shake your hand, bro. You don't even have a clue what you're doing here right now. But God bless you, man. I took a picture of him on my cell phone, pumping gas. <laughs> the, but that was just uh You got to be careful what you say, what you ask said, for, Tyrone. Why you, why you ask? Yeah, well, I, he said, yeah, why you call, I will answer. That's so, right. As I was asking, it was like a Gideon test because I needed to know that, man, I'm way out here on the other side of the United States. I'm from California. I'm in Miami with, you know, strangers. And, you know, I'm, I'm walking in your love, God, and is this real? If it's you, I'm going to walk it out. If it's you. Tyrone, and, I was thinking about when you were telling this story. I was, I, I, this memory came back to me again in my 20s, just before I got saved. It was in that space of time where he started to call my name uh -huh. till that time when I called his name. Uh -huh. You know, he was calling my name and then, you know, eventually I called his name. But in that uh -huh. in that gap in there, you know, I was starting to move towards him and I was I got into transcendental meditation. I got into all kinds of stuff, trying to find God. I was, it was like, you know, where is he? All right. Uh -huh. uh, who is this voice out there? And I remember, I don't even know why a 
20-something-year-old guy smoking dope would even ask this question. But it was a Saturday afternoon. I was home alone. I was sitting on the sofa, and I said, God, I don't know really who you are, but I would like to know the answer to this question. How do I find wisdom? Now, I don't know why I asked that question. I mean, that came out of my mouth. I said, I'd like to know how to find wisdom. Approximately 60 seconds later, there's a knock at the door. (laughs) Sorry, I'm, you know, I got hair down over my shoulders. This is 1970s, you know, I got cut off jeans. I'm, you know, I go slopping over to the door, open up the door. And there are these two little granny standing there these little <laughs> little elderly ladies and they said we would like to come in and talk to you <laughs> and i said okay who are you and they they introduced themselves and they were from a church and they walked in and they had a bible and they said we want to give you this bible because this is the way to wisdom <laughs> and and so and, and so i told these two little church ladies what I had just said. I said, I'm not a Christian. I don't even know how to find God. I just asked him a minute ago, if you're out there, could you tell me how to find wisdom? And and these two little grandmas, they looked at each other. I freaked them out so much, they ran out of my house. It freaked them out. They weren't, they weren't prepared for, I mean, they were out witnessing for God, but they didn't expect God to actually use them. So, you know, the, whatever church they came from, they weren't used uh-huh. to the Holy Spirit moving and, uh-huh. and actually doing things. <laughs> they ran out the door, got in their car, and took off out of my driveway. And I'm standing there holding a Bible saying, i got uh-huh. a big grin on my face. I go, wow. <laughs> I just asked, how do I find wisdom? And two, two grannies showed up and gave me a Bible and said, this is the way to wisdom. So you, uh-huh. I, I can relate. Tyrone, to what's happening here with you. you? You ask these questions and God answers. Yeah. All right, yeah. so at age 13, you heard God say to you, did you yeah. know that my son yeah. died, went to hell, yeah. and rose from the dead? And you said... Yeah. I say, yes, I know he did. And then I paused, you know, and I, it was like, it was a question but needed a proper response. And I said, well, if he did it, I could do it too. And after I said that, God said, come follow me. Let me show you something. Come and follow me. That's where life began for, for me. All right. So yeah. then we fast forward. You're a young adult. You have this experience. Uh, In the raid. With the raid. You're, de- you're dealing drugs. God yeah. gives you two dreams. He tells you, if you keep this up, you're going to be raided by the police. It happened. But the Lord was merciful to you. And he got you out of the trouble. You didn't go to prison. Then we fast forward another 10 years, and now it's July 5th, 2001. You're driving on I-5 in California. Your girlfriend is driving. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. What happened? She falls asleep at the wheel. It was a friend, not my girlfriend. Oh, it was a friend. Okay. Uh And she falls asleep at the wheel, and the accident happens. And when it happened... We didn't hit another vehicle or anything. What happened was is that when she woke up, I woke up from, you know, being tossed to and fro to see her asleep, and I grabbed the wheel because she didn't have the wheel. And, the, you know, the sun was just turning left and right and, you know, out of control. And I grabbed the wheel, and she woke up, you know, like, eh, and hit the brakes. And when she hit the brakes, that's when the front tire popped, in the truck, you know, dug into the ground, and then it just lifted and it kicked it, and it just wham, 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 and just start flipping. So you got you guys were rolling. Yeah, <laughs> we were rolling, and as about the sixth or seventh flip, I remember just seeing sky ground twirling. You know, it went black, blam, and once it went black for me, you know, that's when I had my experience. Okay, Tyrone, yeah, traffic on I-5 is pretty heavy uh, on well, any— At that point in the morning, it was it was light, so— All right, so you didn't get slammed by another vehicle? No, no. It was just uh, the the rolling of the truck and the, the, the speed and the power of it rolling, 
you know, just crushed. Did you guys go into the medium strip or off the side? The tumbling started in the middle of the road. So we were in between the north and the southbound sides of the freeway. So the little gutter part, the middle Okay, part. you were in the medium strip. Okay. Yeah. And that's where the tire blew. And that's where it dug in because it's uneven ground up in there. As the tire popped, it made the front left end of the truck dig, you know, at an angle. And that's what made the truck kick over and started tumbling. Okay, so things go black. What happened? What happened was, is from her side of the story, you know, because I'm up underneath the pond water. When it went black for me, I was ejected out and uh, tossed into that pond, and which would drown. And during that part of me drowning, it went black for a period. And then after the period of blackness for me, I, like, came through the water. You know, like watching science fiction movies, how they'll go into the water, but then they'll, the world flips over and they're on the other side. Right. <laughs> the parallel universe. <laughs> it was sort of like that. And when I came out the water, I was inside the earth. And I knew I was inside because I could see the walls of the cave and you know, you know the inside of the earth. So to know where I'm where I'm at and yet looking around and it's dark, but yet I'm given light to see. And I look up and I see I'm in a giant cave. And I look around, I'm scanning the, the cave and looking around and I look behind me out the same pond that I'm in and I see other people coming out. Now I, I look closer and I see people in front of me, <laughs> you know, who've come out of the water but are laying on the shore. And what's taking place on the shore is that death was releasing itself. As they crossed over, death had to release itself. And different people were dying of different deaths. Some would, you know, be main, you know, tore up. But then within the second that they were released, they would be whole to go forth and I look towards the left of this cave and that's where I've seen the individuals moving to and I've seen the different lines and I was drawn back towards the right and when I looked to the right there was a, a tunnel that was revealed toward the far corner right it was just covered in darkness but it was revealed like lit up for me to see it and I went to move towards it. But now as I went to move, it wasn't like walking time. It was instant time. So I was there at the beginning of the cave. And it's like walking down a school corridor. <laughs> but it was so quick, but so long. And as I started to go down that corridor is when I seen the individuals that were bound that were calling and crying out, you know, and I couldn't help them. You know, if I'd have, you know, reached over with a step, stepped over to the left or to the right, you know, they'd have grabbed you and, and you'd have been in there too. But as I had to keep walking forward, I'm walking down this corridor and I get to the end and that's where I see the drop. You know, it's a bottomless shaft, a uh, pit, you know, now, Looking like from across the parking lot, you know how you have one side of the street versus you're on one side of the street and you got the other side. Now, the, the road really was nothing that separates that side from this side. We see blacktop, we see asphalt, but really that was a bottomless pit for the other side. But the way the earth was broken in, it was kind of like a horseshoe light. So I'm at the hook at the inner hook of the horseshoe, the way the sinkhole I fell in. So it's like I come to the end of the tunnel, and I'm at this entrance, but I'm at the sinkhole, and I can look up and see the sky, and the rim of the, you know, the way it's broken in is when I step out, I'm at an edge, but yet the earth is going around. So I tried to scale the walls <laughs> to come out. And as I'm scaling, I'm getting halfway across because I'm trying to get to the other side. 
to climb up out of this pit. And that's when I slipped and I fell. And I grabbed hold to this vine, and I'm hanging by a vine. And God showed me later in life what the vine was. You know, he revealed himself. He was what I held on to, but at the point of holding on at that point is when God had a conversation with me. And the conversation that he had would uh, let me know my future. He showed me a future place. No one that was in there, but he showed me the place. And it was either choose this place or stay where you are because you're here already. But then myself, I was like, yes, Lord. And what he did, he picked me up by the hairs of my head and, like, took me up and showed me this apartment place and then brought me back down to where I was hanging. And then he revealed to me what I was hanging over. So I light was shown, like, below me as I'm hanging over. I looked over my right shoulder below me, behind me. And I glanced down and seen like the size of a of a diesel. You know, the, the long nosed diesel was a statue head of a demon. The statue head of a demon carved out of rock, sticking out of the earth but over the pit. And he showed me that this is the gates of hell where you are. And I had no strength to pull myself up because it wasn't by might nor by power. The only way you can leave this place is by my spirit. That's why I sent my son to die. And now that you know you're here in this place, it is none but by me. <laughs> and I said, yes, Lord. And his spirit, he put his spirit on me. And his spirit fell. And when it fell upon me, it gave me power to pull myself up out of this place. And... I was light as a feather when his spirit hit me after hanging there, and I climbed up out of that pit. And the second that I touched onto the top of the earth is when I pulled out of the coma. And the doctors, they're standing there, oh, my God, oh, my God. You know, they're tripping out. <laughs> oh, my God, he's alive. <laughs> Tyrone, how, how long had you been in a coma? Five, close to five days. Five days? Yeah. So... It says that one day to God is a thousand years to man. So for the experience time, it was only seconds, moments in eternity, but days on earth, you know, have passed. But it seemed like no time had passed when I came back. They had to tell me that I lost five days. <laughs> but the blessing thing was, was when I came back, and I pulled out of that coma, you know, I was scanning the room, you know, because I'm tripping out. I'm back in this body of pain. and Oh, my God, it's hot up in here. Now I felt the heat. I was burning up in that room. When I came back to my body, I was on fire. And I was so hot up in there that the people, they couldn't understand. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm burning up, and I'm trying to get people's attention. And they're saying, he's trying to talk because they had all these tubes down me. And they were still draining two liters of water and mud from my lungs, which they had slid a hole on the side of my body, you know, and stuck the tube up in there. Now the water is draining out of there and mud. And uh, my mother, before she came to talk to me, I scanned the room and I seen her. When I seen her, I jumped. And I said, oh, my God, what are you doing here? I just left you. You know, because I didn't really know I was in a car accident. But I know I just left my mother, and I don't know what she's doing here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it scared the daylights out of me because, to see, I just left her. I know I left her house. Now, what is she doing here in this room looking at me? And I'm putting it all together, and that's when I, you know, try, trying to tell them I was hot. And she came over and grabbed my hand, and she said, spell it out. And I wrote in her hand, H-O-T. And she said, you hot? And I threw up the, the OK sign. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm burning up. And they put a fan. When they put the fan in the room, as soon as they cut it on, it was like all the heat of hell of the place I just came from just left me. 
Mm. It's blowing it off. You know, Tyrone, I, I personally know a woman. She was a friend of a family member. And I remember my wife, Susan, telling me that her mom was with her when she died. Uh-huh. And my, my wife's mother was with this woman when she died at the hospital. And she kept shouting, somebody fan me. I'm on fire. It's so hot. It's so hot. And that's how she died. Wow. That woman, I hate to think what happened to her in those last minutes. She wasn't a Christian. She never confessed Jesus Christ. She was crying out, somebody fan me. I'm on fire. I'm so hot. Wow. And, she, and then she died. But you were just a reverse. Yeah. You, you died, and then you came back to life, and you're still on fire when you came back into your body. Yeah. Telling them I'm hot, I'm burning up. <laughs> yeah. And when they put that fan on, it just blew the heat off. And it was cool. I just fell asleep again, you know. When were you aware that you had lost your arm? My cousin told me my next time waking up. <laughs> you know how people coming in visiting sure. and you close your eyes, somebody else knew. <laughs> and I closed my eyes one time and opened them up and my cousin was standing there. And, you know, it was right in ICU time. It was right after, you know, they came in and he was like, they're all sitting there worried because they had my head placed towards the left, so I couldn't even look over to the right. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting there, they got this brace on my head. I, my hands is itching. My right hand is itching. The fingers, you know, are tingling. And, man, I want to rub my hand, and I can't see it, but, you know. And all of a sudden, my cousin came in. And he said, man, y'all got to tell him. I'm like, I'm not deaf. I could hear y'all talking over me, and they're like, man, you got to tell him. You can't just have him just sit there like that. He said, I'm going to tell him. And they like, no, he came over. He said, cuz, <laughs> cuz, <laughs> cuz. And when he started getting lower and lower, Kevin said, cuz, and finally he said, cousin, cuz your arm is gone. Your right arm is gone. And I looked at him. And he said, because your arm is going up to here. And when he, you know, used his hand to demonstrate where it's cut off to, and my head was turned toward the left, I tried to turn over to look. I took my left hand, and I started reaching over, because the way it felt, it was supposed to be on my stomach, like where my left hand was, and I could just reach over and touch it. But as I reached over, I kept reaching and I got all the way to the other side of my body, and I could not feel no hand, even though I felt my hand. You could feel your hand, right even though now. it didn't exist. Yeah, and as I reached over, this is when I started to die. You can still feel time. your hand now? Right now. My fist is balled up because the fist ends at the fingertips. But when you move your hand, look at your forearm. You see how your forearm is moving because of the tendons which run all the way through your body from mm-hmm. the shoulder. So if any part of your hand gets cut off, the the fingers which, you know, release and is constricting and whatever it's doing, you feel me? Yes. Once that's cut off, then it just brought, draws up. The fingers are the extension to the nerves which allow your fingers to move up and down, to close the fist, to open. Well, Tyrone, let me ask you this, um, because we only have a few minutes remaining. After you became aware that you were in an accident, that you had lost your arm, how did you start putting all this together and spiritually? Well, God did it. What he did was after I came out of ICU when I was in the trauma unit, you know, and off the sauce and everything, he took me back to the accident, and then he took me back through hell like as if it all just happened again. And when I woke up from that night and I started crying, I was, you know, bawling. Woke up crying and I called my grandmother. (laughs) She picked up the phone, hello, and I'm crying. She's like, baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, I'm ready. I'm ready. (laughs) She was like, repeat after me. And we said, you know, the prayer, Lord, I confess you as My Lord and Savior, I am a sinner. I need for you to come into my life and be my Savior. You know, I confess that you died on the cross and that you rose from the grave. 
I did all the sinner's prayer of, of coming in. And from that moment is when things changed because I realized and knew where he took me from. He didn't allow me to come straight out of the coma and tell because he had tubes down. No, you just have to be still. And when it's his time, then it all came out. And I've been talking about it, telling it every day ever since. And, and you're, you're living for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. You saw hell. Yes, I did. You felt the heat. Yes, I did. You saw the demons. Yes, I've seen the statue head. I experienced the demons here on this earth <laughs> because that's who you're fighting against, principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places. Tyrone, the experience of seeing the portal, the opening of hell, the bottomless pit, the demonic skull head on the rocks, feeling the heat of the fire on your body when you came back. Has that impacted you in the days afterwards till now to avoid sin, to call upon the Lord when you're tempted? Help me, Jesus. I'm being tempted to sin. I don't want to sin. How did that experience change the way you live every day? It changed drastically. Some areas drop off real quick. Other areas, it took time. Yet through him is how you're able to get through it all. Because there were some things that I prayed for that fell instantly. And there were other things by which, because I had to get an understanding of what's going on, because we're still yet in the flesh, but yet we're saved by hope. And then he says that this hope that you're saved by creates a resting place for you even unto death. Why? Because Christ hasn't came back yet. But what he has for you, he says, his grace is sufficient for you. As you are a believer of Jesus Christ, just looking at Paul, Paul had put a whole bunch of things down, but there's this one area where it never highlighted what the area was. It just said he had a thorn in his flesh. And this is the device by which God uses to keep him humble. At least he be exalted above measure. There are some things that God does to certain individuals that are called just to keep them humble. We need a Savior you know? every day, don't we, Tyrone? Every every day. It's not just that we need a Savior one time to get saved. No. We need a it's, Savior every day. That's why he gives you new mercy, because he is the Savior. And the individuals which... He led to captivity, had already lived and died, who had never heard the word. But we are the generations which was to come, which he still covered through his blood. That's why he said it is finished halfway between. <laughs> you are fully persuaded. You are convinced that hell is a real place. It does <clears throat> exist. Yes, it does. He said, let God's word be the truth and every man a liar. So... If he said he created hell in his word, who are we to refute what he said he created? Based on what you saw and experienced during that time you were clinically dead or in a coma. The coma part they put on me after they revived me. Yes, yes. yes. So you were clinically dead and then they revived you and, and then yeah. you were in a coma for days. But based on what you saw and experienced... Would you ever want to change the way you're living now and take the risk that you could spend eternity in that bottomless pit? No. See, this is the one thing I have got, and I had to get an understanding because I knew everybody didn't wear the same jacket of sin. But what jacket is it that we all wear, which you see us all as sinners in? He said, unbelieving. <laughs> Not everybody is a murderer. Not everybody is an adulterer. Not everybody is a fornicator. You hear me? That's right. But what jacket is it that we all wear where God counts us all as sinners? Of the same sin. He said it's unbelief. It is unbelief in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he That's did for right. us at the cross that determines whether yeah. we will spend eternity with God our Father or with Satan our imposter father. That's what it's about. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the That's Son right. of God, that he came to earth in human flesh, and yeah. that he lived a sinless life, 
and that yeah. he went to the cross, he yeah. paid the price for our sins, he <laughs> went to hell, he was raised from the dead, and he yeah. ascended to heaven, and is seated by the right yeah, hand right. of the Father. He is That's making right. intercession for the saints, right. and he's coming <laughs> back in glory for his yeah. church. That's yeah. what it's all about. That's what it's about. Tyrone Williams, <laughs> I thank you, brother, for being on True News today. God bless you so